Welcome to uh, Physics 144. Uh, today I'm going to be doing a short lecture on the delightful nature of vectors. So today this is the introductory material. It corresponds to chapter one in our textbook. And uh, today we are going to just be learning a bit about vectors and some other preparatory material. Now, all of this is in service to the process of mathematical modeling. And in the introductory lecture, I made the case that mathematical modeling was the heart of physics. And the key to all of what we'll be doing here in this class is that we're going to take complicated systems and then simplify them. And this is the hardest part. We have to engage in simplifying a system enough that you can solve it, but it leads to something that is complex enough to be interesting and actually represent the key parts of the physics there. So we're going to start off by relying on what we call a particle model, where we're going to treat masses as having zero dimensions, no length, width, or height, and then explore their interactions. And later on, we'll move on to what happens when we develop the ideas of extended bodies. This also means that we have to come up with mathematical models for things that make the world a little more complex. For example, we have things like air resistance, which we normally would love to ignore, but in a lot of cases we can't, and so we're going to need to develop a way of mathematically representing air resistance, or friction, or springs, other pieces that really require us developing mathematics. So as we go off through our entire course, the subtext Next to all of this is that we are really looking for better mathematical models for representing the world as a whole. And as I said, it's an art. You can simplify a world uh, to be so uh, simple as to be boring, or you can make it too complex to solve. And physics is about picking the right level of artistry to give you the representation of the world that is physically interesting. The other prefatory material we should talk about are units. Uh, the thing, this is largely what distinguishes uh, math from physics. Even though a lot of what we do looks a lot like math, uh, the heart uh, of uh, physics is that it carries with it units because the units are the way of referring our mathematics to the physical world. And so we use the Système International, or the International System of Units, often called SI units, and occasionally I will call them NKS units for meter, kilogram, and second. And this is a base set of measurements that we can use in physics and indeed through all of science that describes literally all the physical quantities in the universe. And then we build up bunches and bunches of composite units from these base SI units, which are, um, you know, like velocity is measured in units of meters per second, which is a composite of a meter and and a second. We're over here on this table. We'll be focusing on our uh, SI units. They're all listed here. We care about the ones really in blue, the meter, the kilogram, and the second. And then as we move on through the rest of physics, you'll care more about the ampere, the Kelvin, or possibly even the candela if you're lucky. Uh, but we are really just going to focus on those top three measures of length, mass, and time. Uh, the other thing is that we do is we'll often make units into composite units for compactness. For example, one joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared, and we just give it a name and an abbreviation just so that we don't have to write out meters and kilograms and seconds in detail all the time, and because it often represents a physically interesting quantity, in this case, energy. Uh, the other thing uh, that we use in science are the metric prefixes. Um, you just flat out need to start learning and knowing these in detail. So you uh, generally will be well served if you go all the way from femto to peta and you know everything in between. Uh, so I can refer to as a micro and you know its abbreviation is mu and its scientific prefix is 10 to the minus six. You should have that sort of built into your brain. It's probably most of the way there already, but now's your chance to kind of say, I'm going to commit to knowing all of these. If you know Know what a yada volt is that's that's all good for you but really this range will cover us through most of uh the things that we care about exa is becoming progressively more important i guess these days too but uh yeah 
learn your metric prefixes. Um, the other thing that we have to do is we have to do a lot of unit conversions. And whenever we convert, I like to use a very kind of straightforward approach that is just multiplying by one. It's a little tedious, but it prevents me from screwing things up. And I'm all about stopping me from making mistakes. Uh, and here's an example of using these conversion factors by multiplying by one. And you know, if you multiply a number by one, it doesn't change its value. Uh, so we can do stuff like convert convert from uh, kilometers per hour, which is sort of what we see on the street, to meters per second, to, to what we use here in the physics labs. Uh, and so we can use the fact that one kilometer is 10 to the 3 meters, and one hour is 60 times 60, 60 minutes times 60 seconds, or 3600 seconds, so that a uh, we can rewrite a conversion factor as 1 as 10 to the 3rd meters over 1 kilometer, or we can write 1 kilometer over 10 to the 3rd meters. And we pick which one of these, the reciprocal or the value uh, itself, uh, because we want to cancel things out. So if I'm going to convert one kilometer per hour, I want to pick this first one, the 10 to the third meter over one kilometer, because that's going to allow the kilometers to cancel out. I'm going to do the same trick with one hour is 3,600 seconds. Divide those by each other. That's one. So I'm multiplying by one, not changing anything. And then I get all these glorious cancellations, leaving behind meters and seconds. Uh, and you do out your math, this is 0 0.277 repeating uh, meters per second, which will go ahead and round to two decimal places, kind of standard process in our uh, theory side of the course uh, of 0 0.28 meters per second. Uh, a slightly more complicated example here would be if I want to care about something in space, which as an astrophysicist, I deeply do. And I'd like to know what the mass density material in space is if the typical density is 0.1, whatever that unit is, it's secretly a solar mass per cubic parsec, also a value. But I'm going to tell you that a solar mass is 1.99 times 10 to the 30 kilograms, and a parsec is 3.09 times 10 to the 16 meters. And they, these are glorious units for me, but maybe uh, a little less obvious for you. And so I can do this conversion. I can figure out that 0 0.1 solar masses per parsec cubed, and I want to multiply by the conversion factor for mass to get rid of that solar mass. So I want a one solar mass in the denominator, and then I want whatever value is in SI units in the numerator, 30 kilograms. So that's going to end up canceling out my solar masses, and I'm on my way. In fact, let's just go ahead and do that now. Goodbye. The next thing we'll do is we'll try to get rid of that parsec cubed. So I know that one parsec is 3.09 times 10 to the 16 meters, but it's a parsec cubed, so I can cube this whole conversion factor, and then I get a parsec cubed, which will cancel out here. Well, all well and good, except I want an answer in grams per cubic centimeter. And so what that means is I have to keep going. I have to know that one kilogram is a thousand grams or 10 to the third grams and that one centimeter or a hundred centimeters is equal to one meter and again i have to cube that and then if i go through my cancellations i will also cancel out my kilograms and i will also cancel out my meters and so i'll be left with the units of grams per centimeter cubed and if i go through and uh, calculate this all out i get a value of 6.74 times 10 to the minus 24 grams per cubic centimeter and so this gives you a sense of just how to do the units. It, you can probably do it faster other ways, but just sort of writing this all out and doing the cancellations will always lead to you not flipping a factor or writing down the wrong values. You just use the equivalencies that you know, and it's all there. So there's nothing wrong with going ahead and doing these things in more detail. Okay. So, uh... Units are also incredibly helpful as kind of cheats in physics because 
physics relies on mathematical equations and equations have equal signs. And that means that everything in an equation, every term that you add together or is set equal to each other must carry units and they must have the same dimension. And so this is an example. You've probably seen this before in your physics existence. This is E is one half mv squared. That's a kinetic energy and mgh is a gravitational potential energy. If the energy has units of joules, every one of these terms here, the mv squared and the mgh, all of those must also carry units of joules. If you have two terms with different units, something has gone horribly, horribly wrong. So that mean, when we say they have the same dimension, it means that they must be equivalent to the same physical quantity, but they're not necessarily the same units. So I could have lengths in kilometers and microns in two different terms, and physics says that's okay. I just have to be careful about the conversion before I add those all together. Something else that you may not appreciate, but is really very important at this point, is that any argument to a mathematical function must be dimensionless. So something like a tangent function, whatever's inside the tangent function, this mg over t, that has to have no dimensions. All the units have to cancel out. And so that must uh, mean that whatever mg is, it must have the same units as T, uh, otherwise it can cancel out. Now, dimensions give us a lot of power here because it also allows us to infer things through this equation or, or this necessity that two sides of an equation are going to have the same units. And so you can actually do some physics from units and scalings alone. And one of the examples is to ask this question, what is the functional form for the period of a pendulum. So what the pendulum? Okay, a pendulum is uh, going to be, I got a little pendulum right here. It's a simple approximation for a pendulum. It is uh, a little mass on top of a string. And what I wanna do is come up with some physical representation for why, how long it takes for this pendulum to undergo one period which is the swing back and forth. So one period is every time it comes over to the side where my finger is. And so that's going to give me one period. And so you might ask, well, what does it depend on? It could depend on the mass of the object that I consider. Could depend on the length of the string. I can actually change the length of the string and do that physics experiment. Ooh, seem, definitely seems to matter. And then I'm also going to make the contention that it actually depends on us being here on Earth, since this whole thing is powered by gravity. And so that means that we actually have to care a bit about the gravitational uh, acceleration here. So I think, just from the power of pure thought, that I can write down a functional form for the period of a pendulum. Now, the period is going to have units of time. So I think that this equation is going to have some form that looks like a period. I'll give it a variable t because that's what we call it here. There's going to be some unknown number in front. I'll call that k, and I'll just label that as uh, unknown constant. It's going to carry no dimensions, unknown constant. And then it's going to depend on the mass that I have suspended from it, but I don't know how it's going to depend on it. So I'm going to actually give it an unknown uh, little variable there called alpha, which represents, I don't know what this is. It's some power uh, to it. I'm going to contend it depends on the length of the string to some other power, beta. And I'm going to contend it depends on the gravitational acceleration of uh, the pendulum uh, raised to some third power that I'll call gamma. And so I think that this is how a pendulum behaves. It contains all the necessary physics that I would have to actually uh, uh, compute here. And then I'm going to simply assert that the this is an equation 
and it must have the same units on both sides. And so I'm going to write out the units here in terms of, I'm gonna put them in little brackets so that you know that I'm talking about the dimensions and not the physical variables themselves. So this means there's gonna be a time over here that constant carries no uh, units. I'm gonna assume that the mass has dimensions of mass raised to the alpha. And then my length, L, is going to be raised to the beta. And then G is 9.81 meters per second squared. And so that is going to just be a meter length uh, over a time quantity squared. And that's all raised to the gamma power. And so we can work this all out. And we know that M is going to be M to the alpha. This is going to be length to the, there's a length, there's a beta and there's a length to the gamma. So it's going to be beta plus gamma. And then it's going to depend on time. And it says gamma uh, time, uh, time raised to the negative two power because it's the denominator uh, to the gamma. So it's going to be to the minus two gamma power. And then we know that that has to equal to dimensions of time over here. Ooh, now we've got something. Notice on the left-hand side, there's time. And on the right-hand side, there's a bunch of other stuff. And so the bunches of other stuff has to go away. So that tells us that the alpha and the, the beta plus gamma must be zero, because uh, it means there's no mass and there's no length when we do all the mass uh, math on the uh, right-hand side of the equation. So that tells us that alpha has to be zero. Uh, and we know that beta plus gamma has to be zero. We also know that minus two gamma over here has to be equal to the power over here, which is implicitly equal to one. And this gives us a nice little system of equations we can solve. So that means that gamma is minus one half. And if I go ahead and substitute gamma equals minus one half here, that means that beta has to be a half. Okay, so we did some math. We kind of put in some weird expressions and we figured something out. But what does this mean? It means that the period, we can take these powers and go all the way back up here, substitute them into our equation, and we get that uh, this is equal to k, m to the zero, don't care. Uh, so length to the beta, which is one half, g to the gamma, which is minus one half. And so this means this has a form of, I'm gonna do a little rules of exponents here. That's the mass goes away, length over g. So we have deduced a functional form up to a constant of what the period of the pendulum is. And it's interesting, it depends on the length, it depends on the planet that you're on, the gravitational acceleration, but it doesn't depend on the mass. And we don't actually know that constant k. It turns out from actual theory that we can do in Phys 146, uh, that this is equal to two pi L over G. But from here, we've managed to get most of the way there. And that's pretty cool. Uh, so that 2 pi comes from actually doing the physics, but by knowing nothing other than putting together a simple physical model, we figured out that it depends on of the length. We sort of saw that. We saw it goes back and forth. And then if I make the period pendulum shorter, it goes back and forth faster. And then I can take another little mass and add it onto my pendulum to increase the mass. And the contention here is that this pendulum it's going to have basically the same length or the same period as the one with only two mass, one mass on it, and it does, which is really pretty cool. So, so you can do a lot of physics with units, and that gives us uh, a lot. Of okay, uh, so let's uh, change our uh, course a little bit. And I want to talk about vectors now. So vectors are a way, uh, something that's essential in physics because it represents a mathematical construction that allows us to represent quantities that have both 
a magnitude, a unit, how much of it there is, and a direction. And that's important because we live in at least a three-dimensional world. And so that means that we have to think about the directions that things are going in. And so we actually care about both how much of something there is and the direction that it's operating. If we don't care about the direction that something is in, we call this thing a scalar. It's something that has no associated direction to it. Common example Examples include like time or mass, things that only have sort of basic units, but stuff th things like velocity uh, or a force, you care about the direction and how much of that there is. And so uh, we have to think about the mathematics of these con constructs. And so we have a lot of uh, vectors here, and I've drawn some vectors on the page, and these are all the same vector. And that's important. It's a two-dimensional vector. We indicate it notationally by drawing an A with a little arrow on it. Uh, occasionally, we'll just do a big bold-faced A in math, but that's hard to actually write down, so we don't actually do that uh, too much when we're writing. Uh, but these are all the same vectors. They're, they don't have a fixed end in any way. It is just a length and a direction. It doesn't matter where that length and direction originates, it's still the same vector. Uh, whenever we want to calculate the actual length of a vector, we call that a magnitude. We put these two little bars on it, uh, and uh, that gives us sort of an absolute value of a vector, which we'll often write without the little vector on top of it. And so that just indicates the length of it without the associated direction. These are all different vectors. A, B, and C all have different lengths and different orientations. They can have the same length and different orientations, still a different vector. Uh, we can combine vectors uh, by basically adding them tip to tail. And if I, so if I told you go 20 kilometers north and five kilometers west, you can figure out where you are with respect to how you got started by th sort of thinking about adding those vectors and we call it tip to tail, which means I draw the first vector and then I start drawing the second vector from the tip of the, the vector I just drew attaches to the tail of the vector I'm drawing. So here's C plus D, and then I measure from the tail of the first vector to the tip of the last vector, and that is the resulting vector of adding this up. And if I did 20 kilometers north and 5 kilometers west, you can figure out where you are from where you got started by measuring this uh, vector here. So we can do the naive thing and add up some vectors. Uh, so if I say, here's some vectors, add them up, you just start adding them up tip to tail. So you take a vector, boop. you take the next vector, you add it to uh, put the tail at the tip of that vector. Then this vector, you add uh, tip to tail there. And then final vector comes down here. And that gives us our tip to tail addition. And so then we just, you know, calculate the resultant from the tail of the first vector to the tip of the last vector. So that is, in red is the final vector. So the neat thing about this of, uh, is that the order of the addition isn't actually important. You can uh, basically put them together in any order, and you will always find that the uh, tail of the first vector to the tip of the last vector is the same vector. In all cases, it's this vector right here, here, and here. So we call this commutivity. You might think that that's all uh, boring, and why do I care about comm commutivity? Everything's commutative, but it's not. More on that in like 20 minutes. Uh, so we have to be careful there. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's all our resulting vectors. I knew they were right. Uh, vector subtraction is just adding the inverse. Uh, and so we have to come up with the idea of what an inverse vector is. And so the inverse of a vector is just the vector going in the opposite direction but has the same length. And so if A is here, negative A is here. And that's because A plus negative A tip to tail, gets you back to where you started. And so that means that a plus negative a equals zero, and the zero length vector is the vector with zero length. Direction doesn't matter because it has uh, zero length. Okay, so we can add and we can subtract. 
Now we have to multiply vectors. And so the obvious way to start multiplying vectors is to do scalar multiplication. Uh, and that's just repeated additions of a vector. And so if I have three vectors, uh, I just add them up tip to tail, doo -doo -doo -doo, and that gives me three times a. So now it's called a scalar because the three is a scalar value in front of it. And then uh, the actual vector is the a. So you can multiply any number, uh, any scalar times a vector, and that just increases or decreases its length. So you can do additions like this, which asks for a minus 3c plus 2b. And so graphically, we can do that by saying, OK, it's a. Yeah, that's about right. Uh, so c would be going off in that direction. Uh, so negative c is going to be going in this direction, and we need three of them to three. So that's minus three c, and then two b. Here's b. So I draw one b, and then I draw another b, Boop. and that gives me a resulting vector. Then. So that's a minus three c plus two b. Okay. Uh, cool. So uh, then we have a nice little vector here. Okay. Now, we'll often need to describe these vectors in the context of coordinate systems. So in coordinate systems, we really do need to define a perpendicular set of axes. Not always perpendicular, but for our purposes, we'll start out with perpendicular axes. Uh, we'll often give them the names x and y, and then z will be the uh, third dimension to our coordinate system. And so then we will uh, measure the projections of a vector onto the coordinate axes, and we'll often call this the components of a vector. And this relies on trig that you have become sort of, you have know, learned to live and breathe over the past couple years. Uh, and so we take a vector a, and we can figure out its components by taking the magnitude of a, that's remember without the vector sign, uh, and its projection in the y direction is just going to be a sine theta, and in the x direction is going to be a cos theta. So that's using the basic definitions of sine and cosine with the magnitude of a being the hypotenuse of this uh, triangle here and it's a right triangle with this little angle here uh, theta and so we do this operation all the time and it is probably one of the the sort of most straightforward things that ends up costing us uh, the most headache uh, is to figure out the projections onto coordinate axes. So as an example, we can say, what is the uh, projections of this vector that's five meters long onto the primed coordinate axes? So that's when we say prime, that's this little uh, symbol there, the little quotation mark. We call that a prime in physics. And so here's y prime and there's x prime there. And so I want to figure out the projections along the x and then the y uh, coordinates here. So in reality, I really want to figure out what's happening inside this triangle right here. I don't give you the angle that I actually care about right here. That's unfortunate. Uh, but what I can do is use some uh, vertical angle geometry right here. So these two are straight lines. So this must be 40 degrees. And then I know that this is a right angle because it's x and y axes. And so everything in there must sum to 90. And so that means that this angle here is 20 degrees. And so that means that this in the x prime direction is going to be equal to 5 times the cosine of 20 degrees. Check the mode of your calculator, make sure you're not living in radian mode, and you'll find that that's 4.70. And then in the x direction, that's going to have a magnitude of five times cosine, oh sorry, that's not a cosine, that's the whole point, the sine is 20 degrees. And so that has a value, this length is 1.71. But it's projected in the negative y direction going down here. So the value in the ax is going to be 
4.70 meters. I think it's specified its meters up here. Uh, and then the A, or sorry, and this is the X prime coordinates. A Y prime, the projection in the Y prime, is going to be minus 1.71 meters. And that minus sign again comes because we're projecting this direction is measured down along the Y prime axis. So there we go. We've got the vectors, the sum of components along the primed axis. Okay. Now, we actually get a little more sophisticated with this approach by representing this vector as a sum of components of uh, times these vectors that we call the unit vectors. And unit vectors uh, are called unit because they have length one. This is different from like a kilogram or a meter. This is the mathematical definition where one is the unit element of uh, the real numbers. So that's what we mean by unit uh, in this case. So it just means length one. So unit vectors, length one, uh, and we define them along the coordinate axes in this case. And we give them special names. And your book has decided to give them special names i, j, and k corresponding to the x, y, and z axes respectively. Occasionally they'll be given uh, other names like x, y, and z, and when it always represent a unit vector by giving it a little hat, which uh, I guess means you pronounce it funny in French, but uh, we just say hat. And so we will pronounce this thing right here as that's an i hat, which just means unit vector, so link one vector, i means along the x axis. So I hat. J hat is the unit vector on the y axis, and K hat is the unit vector along the z axis. So that gives us uh, a way of actually describing vectors in terms of uh, these components. So A can be represented as AX I hat plus AY J hat, which is the components in the x direction. And we sort of represent this as a tip to tail vector sum of going in the x direction for a cos theta and then times the one the direction of i hat and then we go up a sine theta and the reason why we develop these unit vectors is that they don't have any sort they have length of one and so we can only pay attention to the magnitudes they are really only indicating direction now as a trick Sometimes you can define a unit vector along any vector uh, by simply taking a vector and dividing it by the magnitude of the vector. So we can often get like a vector called u hat, which is pointed in, in the same direction as a hat, but then uh, you take a and divide it by the scalar magnitude there. And so that gives you a vector along a given uh, direction. So that's a way that we will often develop unit vectors uh, because unit vectors are just giving us direction. We are setting their magnitude to one to simplify all of our uh, results. Okay. Now, you probably remember uh, that using trigonometry and Pythagoras, we can relate uh, the magnitude to the components. Uh, we can do that with the Pythagorean theorem, where the length of the hypotenuse is ax squared plus ay squared, square root. Uh, this actually holds in all dimensions, so ax squared plus ay squared plus az squared. And if you wanted to find a w axis and keep going, you can do that. Uh, mathematics isn't stopping you, but it's this... Uh, Pythagorean sum, uh, where you add up to the squares of everything and then take the square root, and that allows you to figure it out in high dimensions, uh, as well as two and three, you know, ordinary dimensions. Uh, so that's the way we figure out the length, given the components. We also have to figure out directions of angles. Uh, we'll often worry about this in two dimensions. Uh, it gets trickier in three and higher dimensions. Uh, but there we will use, use a arc tangent function. The arc tangent of y over a, ay over ax gives me the angle, but this is important. Your calculator is very happy to just give you an answer in quadrants one and quadrant four of your unit circle trigonometry. If we're over here in the negative uh, x direction, it's gonna be uh, a little less aware. So sometimes you're gonna have to add 180 degrees uh, to, or you're gonna have to, sorry, you're gonna have to take the complement uh, or the supplement of the angle that you're worried about. So 180 minus the angle uh, to get the actual value here. Here, 
diagrams and drawing it out will be really helpful to make sure you're getting into the right quantities there. Okay. So backing off uh, from a lot of uh, these values, uh, we can also explore the glory of unit vectors by knowing how to add them up uh, using the components. Uh, so we can add up two vectors by adding up their unit vectors. And unit vectors essentially are scalar. We can basically treat the uh, uh, components in front as scalar multiples times the unit vectors. And so we're essentially collecting like terms uh, to put these together. And so to figure out a plus b, we add together the ax and the bx, and that's all in front of the i hat. And then the ay and the by all fit in front of the j hat, which got big for some reason here. Anyways, uh, this works for any number of vectors in any number of dimensions, and it's kind of why we like our unit vectors uh, so darn much. So we can do an example of that uh, using uh, an equation like this, where we say, okay, uh, figure out what a plus b plus c is in terms of magnitude and direction using your unit vectors. So uh, I'm going to say that this is a, b, and c. I'm going to define this angle here, 40, to be theta, just so i carrying around algebra and not... Um, uh, carrying around algebra and not um, like numbers. And I'll call this down there, I'll give that the Greek letter phi, which looks like a theta, but the slash goes all the way through it. Whereas a theta keeps it slash well confined. Okay, uh, so in that case, the vector A is going to be the magnitude of A, which is 12 centimeters, uh, times the cosine of theta in the i hat direction, plus, the magnitude of a sine theta, this time measured in the j hat direction. b is going to be negative, so it's measured in the negative direction. Uh, b times cos 20 degrees, or phi, in the i hat direction, minus b sine phi in the j hat direction. And then C is just going straight down along the vertical axis, and so that's going to be minus C times J hat. And then we just add up the things in front of the I hats and the things in front of the J hats. So D is going to be equal to A cos theta minus B cos phi I hat plus A sine theta minus B sine phi, oh, eh? uh, minus c j hat. And then I can plug in numbers. So a is going to be 12 centimeters cos 40 degrees minus, um, what was it, 5 centimeters uh, cos 20 degrees. All that's times i hat. I can put that in front because I'm wild. Uh, plus, whoop, uh, let's see here, 12 centimeters uh, times the sine of 40 degrees minus 5 centimeters times the sine of 20 degrees minus 7 centimeters uh, all times j hat. And that all comes out. We'll plug it into our calculator and we will get that this is 4.494. I hat, that's not I hat, that's an I hat, minus 0 0.996 J hat. So that's the actual vector. I can calculate the magnitude of D as the square root of 4.494 squared plus negative 0 0.996 squared, all square root. And so the magnitude of that is going to be 4.60. Oops, I was bad. I forgot units. These are all in centimeters. So this is in centimeters. Okay, so that gives me the magnitude. And then I can figure out the direction. So for reference, it looks like we have our vectors pointing off kind of like... Uh, 4.94 in the i hat direction, minus 1 in the j direction. 
So our vector looks like this. That's our actual d. So we know its angle is going to be below the x-axis by a little bit. And so the angle, uh, we'll call that angle gamma. Gamma is going to be the arctangent, tan, of the y component, which is minus 0 0.996 over the x component, 0 0.4. 4.494, take the arctangent of that, and that's minus 12.5 degrees. So that tells me that the gamma here is going to be 12.5 degrees measured down from the plus x axis. So that gives us sort of the component y of adding these things together. You uh, may have similar results, but the whole point of that is to show you kind of how we treat our unit vectors. Okay, so the last thing we need to talk about in terms of vectors is multiplying vectors. Now, we've talked about scalar multiplying, uh, but what happens if we want to multiply two vectors? And there are two ways that we multiply vectors together. And physics sort of motivates these two different needs. Uh, the first of which is what we will call the scalar, I'll almost inevitably call it the dot product, because the dot is the symbol in between the two vectors that indicates how we're multiplying it together. Uh, and the way we want to, what we actually need, is a measurement for how one vector projects onto another vector. And so it has the expression that a dot b is equal to the magnitude of a here times the magnitude of b times the cosine of the angle in between them. And what that is actually representing is the projection of one vector measured along another vector. And so the um, it's kind of a measure of how parallel two vectors are to each other. Uh, and so this uh, example here that we see is work. Uh, you may know work from earlier in your physics career. Uh, work depends on how much force you're pushing on an object and how far it moves as a result of that force, its displacement. But the only work is done is if the force and the displacement are aligned and you only care about the parallel components of that sort of force moving through the distance. And so we often think about this in the context of if a, b cos phi, and we look at how much b projects along a, that value has a magnitude of b cos phi, and then we multiply it by the length of a. And so that's essentially a representation of how parallel these two vectors are in interacting. So that means perpendicular vectors, are going to have no dot product. They are dot product of zero because the cosine of 90 degrees is zero, and so it's not going to give us any parallelism uh, there. We kind of uh, codify that in detail by looking at the um, unit vectors. And so two unit vectors, uh, i dot i, or j dot j, or k dot k, or whatever, are going to be both have magnitude of one and zero angle between them because they're the same vector and so cosine of zero is one and so i dot i is one but any two different unit vectors say i dot j will have 90 degrees between them and so the cosine of 90 is zero and so i dot j is zero uh, so this gives us the dot product of two same uh, the same vectors gives us one and the dot product of different vectors gives us zero so that means we can do all kinds of gory uh, math here. And so that means if I multiply this out, uh, I can write down two vectors, a, uh, a, y, a x i hat plus a y j hat plus a z k hat. These are two arbitrary three-dimensional vectors. And I can calculate their dot product. And this involves distributing. And so this is ax times bx, i hat dot i hat, ax, uh, then the ax multiplies by the second term, which gives us the i hat dot j hat term, and then the ax i hat multiplies by the third term, bzk, and so we multiply out all of these terms, and so it's a trinomial times a trinomial, and we get nine terms. Well, that sounds all right. But then the dot product of any two unit vectors that are different goes to zero. 
And so that means six of these terms go to zero because uh, they're the ones that have mixed dot products. And then we can simplify that down and you get the i hat dot i hat and the j hat dot j hat and the k hat dot k hat. These are all one, leaving behind that the dot product of two vectors is ax bx, ay by, az zz, and then you add them all up together. And so that makes it fairly simple to calculate dot products of uh, vectors. So as an example, we can say, if I give you these three vectors, uh, a and or two vectors and dot them together, uh, the way I can do this is just say, okay, well, a, oh, that's, uh, a dotted with B is the product of the X components. That's three times negative two. So this is AX and BX plus uh, then the next term, the J components. So, so that becomes minus two for the J hat and then times four, uh, j hat times j hat. So this is a y and b y. And then for the z hat, we do uh, plus five, and then this is implicitly plus zero k hat. So that's five times zero, which of course is the a z, and then the b z. And so that term goes away, oops, in red. And then we say this is minus three times three is minus nine, minus uh, eight, and so that gives me a value of, oops, sorry, I've screwed this up. This is not a three. This is a two, because this is a two. So it's three times negative two. So this is minus six, minus eight, or minus 14. So the dot product of these two vectors is just minus 14. Okay, so the final thing we want to talk about today is the cross product, which is the multiplication of two vectors with respect to each other. Uh, and this is, uh, in contrast with the dot product, it's a measure of how perpendicular the two vectors are to each other. And this matters in concepts like for, uh, torque. Uh, in physics. So for example, if I'm going to go ahead and open a door, the effectiveness of how well I can open a door, this is like a top-down view of a door, depends on the force that I'm pushing and pulling on it. Uh, this is the hinge around which the door pivots. And if my uh, force is acting close to the hinge, it's not as effective. And if it's far from the hinge, it's a lot more effective. Uh, but we also have uh, the idea that if I take my door and I'm sort of push on it sideways in towards the hinge so that my force is going in in this direction, I'm not going to be really good at opening it. I want my uh, force to be perpendicular to the, what we call often the lever arm of the for, uh, of the door. And so this requires something that we call the vector product or the cross product. It measures when forces are perpendicular to each other and then the larger the vectors are, uh, then the larger the quantity is. So that the um, vector product has a value of a cross B, uh, which is a B sine of the angle between them when you place the vectors tip to, uh, tail to tail. Uh, and so this becomes, because it's sine, it's at its largest when it's 90 degrees. And this is why I say it's a measure of kind of perpendicularism. But there's also a weird thing about the vector. And you'll notice that I've tacked on this magnitude is the vector product. When you multiply two vectors with the vector product, you get a third vector. And this is one of the trickiest concepts you get to encounter in first uh, and second year physics, which is the idea that this vector uh, product leads to a vector that is perpendicular to both input vectors. So uh, there are two choices for your vector. Uh, that are perpendicular to it. So if I have an A and a B, and I'm considering a cross B uh, in this case, I could be going up here, or I could be going down. This is supposed to be a three-dimensional drawing, and so it sort of illustrates it this way. So if I'm going upward, 
uh, that's the A cross B direction, and we pick that one uh, based on this thing that we call the right-hand rule. And we ignore the one going down in this direction uh, because that's not the right-hand rule. And we call it the right-hand rule because basically the right-handed people outnumber left-handed people. And so we just had to pick a convention and the convention is based on uh, what, what, the right rule, uh, the right. And so we, uh, all our coordinate systems, everything here kind of follows the right-hand rule. We just had to pick one and we did that. Uh, so uh, the uh, vector product uh, is going to give you, uh, to actually construct the right-hand rule, what you need to do is to have a right hand or imagine one. And so if you take your right hand and you point your index finger in the direction of the first vector in the vector product, and then you point your middle finger in the vector of the second vector product, and you stick your thumb up, then the resulting direction of your thumb is the uh, resulting vector. And the trick is you have to do this with your right hand. And this is actually why left-handed people are better at physics, is they can keep writing exams and apply the right-hand rule without having to stop. So that gives you the right-hand rule. So practically what this means is we also define our coordinate systems to be right-handed. And so that means that if we have our A and our B vectors here represented as the unit vectors, the k vector is pointing off in the direction of your thumb. So that means if your index finger is the x and your middle finger is the y, then the direction of the z-axis is in the direction that your thumb goes for your right hand. Your left hand goes in the opposite direction. That's why it's a left-handed coordinate system. And we just pick a right-handed coordinate system in all of mathematics and physics, except for some reason, astrophysics. Don't get me started. All right. So that means that I cross J is K. And it also means that J cross K is I and K cross I is J. Uh, so this kind of leads to this sort of circular permutation of I goes to J goes to K. And so as long as you're going in that order, I, J, K in a circle, you get uh, kind of in these positive direction. Uh, you get these, uh, you get the next one in that sequence. Okay, uh, and so here's a quick illustration of where our I's, our J's, and our K's are. So if I take my uh, index finger and I point it along I, and I point my middle finger along the J, uh, I get a vector uh, in the thumb pointing off in the K direction. So try this at home, align your right hand with the coordinate system shown here, and that'll give you I cross J is K. Uh, sometimes what I also like to do is to just sort of use my whole hand and my thumb and I will point my whole wrist uh, and my hand in the direction of the first vector and then I will turn it inward, you know, in the direction that doesn't break my wrist uh, and into the second vector and then the third vector is pointing up along that direction. So this will be hopefully a little more obvious in class where we can all have our hands and be trying things out, uh, but we'll do that. Uh, okay, so this also means uh, that if we care about I cross I, that's going to have a value of zero because the angle between them is zero and sine of zero is zero. Uh, so vector unit vectors crossed with themselves are zero. Now, this also means that the vector product is anti-commutative. I warned you this was coming. Uh, and so that means that if I switch the direction and I choose what uh, uh, how I am uh, how I am calling my first vector, uh, and I reverse the order of that vector multiplication, I actually introduce a negative sign. I turn the whole system upside down. So if I have my a and my b pointed in this direction, and then I switch and I go to a or b and a. I switch the direction going downward. So A cross B in this case goes up and then B cross A in our coordinate system goes down. And that's the opposite direction from A cross B. Okay, so that gives us lots of sort of gory details to uh, go through. 
Uh, and let's actually talk about how we practically apply this. Okay, I can actually calculate here uh, some vector products uh, using those same two vectors that we had earlier. Uh, vector product, I'm going to show you two different ways of calculating it. Uh, one is kind of grinding it out with our cyclic permutations. So we have this, uh, our unit vectors of i goes to j goes to k goes to i. And if we're going around in that circle, uh, we uh, get positive uh, vectors. Otherwise, we uh, get negative cross products of unit vectors. So let me explain that by sort of showing in more detail how this works. So A cross B is going to be 3 okay, uh, I hat minus 2 J hat plus 5 K hat crossed with minus 2 I hat plus 4 J hat. And so then I just have to multiply it out. I'm going to get six terms. So I'm going to go three times negative two is minus six times i hat cross i hat. I know that that's zero. I can just cancel that out right now. So that's zero. Okay, the next is three i hat times uh, plus four j hat. So that becomes plus three times four is 12 times i hat cross j hat. Okay, next term is going to be minus 2 j hat times minus 2 i hat. So that's going to be uh, plus 4, and we have to preserve the order. So it's j hat cross i hat. Okay, and then the next term is going to be uh, here. It's going to be negative 2 times plus 4 j hat cross j hat. So that's going to be minus 8 j hat cross j hat. We know that's going to drop out to zero. And then the next terms are going to be plus, uh, let's see here, it's going to be plus, uh, oh, sorry, I wanted to highlight them. We do the 5k times the minus 2i, so that becomes minus 10 times k hat uh, cross i hat. And then we get the last term, which is uh, plus 20 k hat cross j hat. Okay, uh, so I can cancel out things that are the same. That all goes to zero. And then I, then I just sort of work out from my little permutation circle here uh, how the vectors uh, uh, work out. So i hat cross j hat, I said was k hat. So this... Uh, this term here becomes 12 k hat. Okay, so that's done. j hat cross i hat is going backwards. So I know that i hat cross j hat is k hat. So j hat cross i hat must be minus k hat. So this term here becomes minus 4 k hat. So let me just go ahead and say that this goes to k hat, and then this goes to minus k hat. Okay, uh, so k cross i is proceeding in uh, around my circle here in the positive direction. So k cross i is going to be a j hat. So there we go. I'll just call that a j hat. And then k cross j is going backwards around the circle. So this must go to minus i hat. So that means that I have, uh, in total, I'm going to have minus 10 j hat, and then I'm going to do minus 20 i hat. And so that gives me my vector product, minus 20 i hat, minus 10 j hat, plus 12 minus 4 is plus 8 k hat. So we've successfully executed a cross product multiplication. I never do this. It is so easy to screw up. So I'm going to just teach you an algorithm. There's a wonderful reason why this works, and you will learn it in Math 125 or Math 102. But we got to know it now. Here's the alternative approach. And just, so this is a trust me situation. So the first thing I do is I write across the top. I make three rows. I write down the unit vectors i, j, k, and then I write i and j again. Then I write down my first vector. So this is, I start out with the unit vectors. Unit. 
Then I write down A and then I write down B and I just write down the numbers of the components. Uh, so A is going to be three. It's J component is minus two. This K component is five. And then I write this first two things again. So three and minus two. Oops. Then I do the same thing for the B vector. And so it starts out with minus two in the I hat column plus four in the J hat column, and it has nothing in the K hat column. So I just put a zero there and I write down minus two and then four again. So I have these numbers. And then what I do is I'm going to carry out diagonal multiplication. So I'm going to multiply these things together and I'm going to multiply these things together. I'm going to multiply those things together. So I do, I start out here, and so I take the i hat times minus 2 times 0. So that's going to be 0. I'm not even going to write that down. The next thing I write down is the j hat times the 5 times the minus 2. So that's negative 10 j hat. So all I did was I went like this. And then I do the same thing for the k, which is k hat times 3 times 4. And so that is going to give me plus 12k hat. Okay, so now I've done essentially three, let's, let's do this in red. Yeah, so I've done the three, uh, the three diagonals going that way. And then I do the three diagonals going the other way. So when I go backwards, the diagonals in this direction, uh, I have to add a minus sign. So that goes negative 2 times negative 2 is plus 4 times k hat, but I'm going backwards, so it becomes a minus 4. Minus 4 k hat. Then I do again. Uh, 4 times 5 is 20 times i hat, but it's going backwards diagonal, so that's minus 20 i hat. And then 0 times 3 times j doesn't exist. And then I collect my like terms, so I get minus... 20 i hat minus 10 j hat plus 8 k hat, which if we go back and check, it's the same result we got here. So this is just an algorithm. It kind of collects things together. And so you write out the three rows and you do the forward uh, diagonals with a plus sign and you take the backwards diagonals and add a minus sign. And then that'll give you your uh, cross product if you have to execute it. We'll do exercise this a lot more on sort of the homework and class exercises. And then we'll come back when we start studying torques and rotation and we'll apply a lot of physics with it. So. That brings us to the end of everything that I wanted to say about vectors. Uh, I hope you uh, got uh, the basics of this out of it, and I will see you in class. Uh, Ta-da!